All right, so chapter 52 is introducing us to ecology and the biosphere. Um, ecology is the study of interactions between organisms and the environment. Um, these interactions help to determine where organisms are going to be found and their relative abundances. Um, we have to use both observation and experimentation with modern ecology, and that picture you just saw is what was thought to be extinct, the harlequin toad in Costa Rica. And so that it was rediscovered um, led to several questions. The environmental factors that are limiting their distribution and any other factors that are impacting on their population size. And ecology is similar to what we've been doing throughout biology. You can look at it at all variety of levels. You can look at it from individual organisms to planets as a whole. So we're going to talk about each of these global landscape, ecosystem, community, population, and organismal ecology. So global ecology is um, dealing with the biosphere, which is your global ecosystem, all of the plants ecosystems together. It examines how energy and materials have influenced organisms throughout the biosphere. Landscape ecology is when we are looking at connected ecosystems, a mosaic of those, also known as a seascape or landscape. And so it's going to be looking at the interchange between energy and materials and organisms between multiple ecosystems. Ecosystem ecology is focused specifically on an individual ecosystem, that um, community of organisms in a specific area, and the physical factors, the abiotic factors, in which they interact. Um, so biotic and abiotic components are going to be um, examined more specifically within an ecosystem ecology. Um, we are going to be still looking at energy flow, and we're going to look at chemical cycling. A community is populations of different species in a specific area, and so it is dealing with those interactions between those species um, in that community. A population is a specific group of individuals of the same species that are in a certain area, and it'll be looking at factors that affect their size over time. Um, and by size, I'm talking about the numbers of, of the members of that population, not whether they are um, recently um, born from embryos or from hatching from eggs um, to full-blown adults. Um, organismal ecology is looking at how an organism's physical structure, its physiology, and for animals, more specifically behavior, um, are going to deal with environmental challenges. Um, this can involve not just, um, well, it can involve all of those different types of ecology that we just kind of talked about within um, the larger blanket of organismal ecology. So climate. Um, we're gonna, climate is looking at long-term prevailing weather conditions, not day by day, but how things are changing over an extended period of time. There are four major abiotic components that play a role in this, temperature, precipitation, sunlight, and wind. When we're talking about macroclimate, we're looking at patterns that are more um, on a larger scale, the growth scale, um, global, regional landscape. Microclimate, would be looking at specific locations, um, very fine patterns. And the example I've given you is a community of organisms underneath a log. So global climate patterns are determined pretty much by solar energy and how the planet is moving in space. Um, the sun's warming effect will cause variations in temperature, which can then influence the different cycles, um, evaporation and how air and water are circulated. And as a result, there will be variations latitudinally in terms of climate. So sunlight hits at different angles, and that's going to affect its intensity, as well as um, the amount of heat and light that is obtained for each surface. So you can see there that at um, the North Pole and at the South Pole, um, in this particular example, the angle of the incoming sunlight is going to be pretty low, while at the equinox at the equator, the sun's straight on. And then at the tropics, it's still hitting it pretty close to straight on, but there's a little bit more of an angle to it. So circulation and precipitation patterns. Water will evaporate in your tropics. Warm, wet air masses will flow from the tropics up towards the poles or down towards the poles. Air masses that are rising release water, and that will cause lots of precipitation, especially in your tropics. Um, 
dis the drier air masses that are descending are going to create your more arid climates. Those are typically found around 30 degrees north and south. And then air that's flowing closer to the Earth's surface is able to generate predictable patterns in terms of wind, globally speaking. Um, cooling trade winds are going to blow from east to west in your tropics, while you have prevailing westerlies that blow from west to east in your more temperate zones. So there you can see the westerlies um, and flowing towards the North Pole and South Pole. And there you see the trade currents, uh, the Northeast trade and the Southeast trade. And you see the descending dry air, which is taking in water, and then the ascending air that's releasing it. So cycles, just kind of like what we've talked about before with feedback. Regional local effects on climates. Climate can be affected by your seasons, by large bodies of water, as well as mountains. Okay. Seasonality will be dependent on light and temperature. It's going to, variations are going to increase steadily towards the poles. Um, at high altitude, sorry, high latitudes is caused by the Earth's axis of rotation, the tilt it's on, and its passage around the sun. There are um, going to be belts of wet and dry air straddling the equator that shift throughout the year um, based on this angle of the sun changing. And when the wind patterns change, that can affect your ocean currents. So oceans, currents, and large lakes are able to moderate the climate of nearby terrestrial environments. That's why you don't tend to see um, as much of an issue with snow and freezing rain as you get closer to the oceans um, on those terrestrial environments because that helps to moderate it, keep the temperature above freezing. The Gulf Stream takes warm water and carries it from the equator to the North Atlantic. So during the day, air will rise over warm land and will draw in cool breezes from the water across it. And then as the land cools down at night, the air will rise back up over the warmer water, drawing in the cooler air from the land back over the water, and then that will be replaced by warm air from offshore. So you can see the cycles there taking place. Mountains. Rising air will release moisture on the windward side of the peak and creates a rain shadow. It'll absorb moisture on the leeward side. The mountains will affect how much sunlight a certain area gets. In the northern hemisphere, your south-facing slopes get more sunlight than your north-facing slopes. And every 1,000-meter increase in elevation will cause a temperature to drop approximately 6 degrees. When I was out in Colorado back in December, um, I was um, recommended to go to this lake. And it was... Mm, probably the 40s at the bottom. And as we climbed up the mountain to get to the lake, um, it, the temperature kept dropping and dropping. And by the time we got to the lake, it was snowing. Um, so it's pretty amazing how quickly that temperature can drop as your elevation increases. Okay, so there you can kind of see the leeward side and the airflow moving across from the ocean across those mountain ranges. Microclimate. We talked about those being more fine scale differences. Um, so those environments are going to be influenced by both their abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic are your non-living um, factors, temperature, light, water, nutrients. Your biotic are the organisms making up that particular environment. So global climate change, this can definitely have um, significant impacts on our biosphere. Um, we can examine this in one way to look at what has happened in the past. So when the glaciers retreated 16,000 years ago, the tree distribution pattern um, changed. And then as climate has changed, species that might have had difficult dispersing either um, had smaller ranges or may become extinct. And so those are kind of predictions as to what is going to happen um, over the next century if we have a 4.5 degrees Celsius increase in temperatures and if we have a 6.5 degree Celsius increase. So in 1997, you can see the range of this particular butterfly, while in 1970, you can see its range was a little bit smaller. So terrestrial biomes are um, able to be identified by both their climate and just disturbance. Um, biomes in general are your life zones that are recognized by their vegetation type um, or their environment. So terrestrial and aquatic. We're going to focus on terrestrial in this section. We'll do aquatic next. 
Um, climate is going to play a key role in determining why we find certain biomes in different in, in specific areas of our planet. Um, we talked previously how climate will affect the latitudinal patterns. A climograph will allow you to plot temperature versus precipitation in a region. Um, the biomes are not just going to be affected by those two quantities, but they will also be affected by the pattern that is seen over an, a year in an annual period. All right, so those are um, several of the terrestrial biomes. I don't think we're going to talk about all of these, but we will definitely hit on the majority. Okay. And so there's kind of a plot of temperature versus precipitation. You can kind of see where there is some overlap, but there definitely are areas that are unique to each of those biomes. So features that are generally seen in terrestrial biomes, um, again, they tend to be named for either physical or climatic factors, um, as well as for vegetation. Um, as you saw in the previous graph, they don't just, um, they aren't separate, distinct from one another. There are overlaps. Um, that area where they grade into one another, the intergradation and ecotone could be wide or it could be narrow. Um, vertical layering um, can consist in a forest of an upper canopy, a low tree layer, shrub understory, a ground layer of herbaceous plants, a forest floor, and a root layer. So lots of different layers can play a role within a biome. Um, by having those different layers, you're able to provide a lot of different habitats where animals can survive um, or flourish. Uh, biomes are not static. Um, they're very dynamic. They have um, ranges of patchiness throughout them. Um, and it's thought that similar characteristics that are um, have arisen over time in biomes that are separated from one, one another um, are thought to happen through convergent evolution. And so an example of that would be North America cacti and African desert euphorbs. They look a lot alike, but they are definitely from distinct um, evolutionary lineages. So disturbance, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Disturbance is something that has happened in that particular environment. Storm, fire, human activity, it causes a change in the community. If you have lots of fires that can kill off your woody plants, it might be able to help maintain the vegetation of a savanna. Um, if you have fires or pest outbreaks that could cause some of those gaps we talked about in your forest that would allow um, different species to be able to grow. Um, and fire suppression has um, changed the vegetation that's present in our Great Plains. Um, we're going to look at terrestrial biomes in terms of their distribution, precipitation, temperature, plants, and animals. So first one we're going to talk about our tropical forest. Um, this is found in equatorial and sub-equatorial regions. The rainfall is pretty constant, while if we're dealing with dry forest, um, and rainforest is pretty constant. In dry forest, the precipitation tends to be more seasonal. It's pretty high year-round, 25 to 29 degrees Celsius. That would be like 78, low 80s, um, little seasonal variation. Um, their forests are vertically layered. We talked about that already. The competition for light is pretty intense because of that layering. It's home to millions of animal species, um, many that have not been identified yet. And human population growth is destroying a whole lot of these. Okay, so there's an example of a tropical rainforest in Borneo. You can see on the map where we're likely to find this biome. Desert. These occur in bands 30 degrees north and south of the equator, interior of continents. Precipitation is pretty low, highly variable, um, typically less than 30 centimeters a year. They can be hot or cold. Um, the plants are adapted for heat and desiccation tolerance, so they can tolerate not getting water for an extended period of time. They have to be able to store water so they can survive. And they'll have reduced surface area with their leaves um, because if they take in more light, they're going to need to use more water. Um, common desert animals are snakes, lizards, scorpions, ants, beetles, migratory resident birds, seed-eating rodents. Lots of these are nocturnal when the temperature is a little lower. Urbanization. Conversion to irrigated, irrigated agriculture have reduced some of the natural biodiversity of deserts. So there's a desert in southwest U.S. And you can see those on the maps, the peach. Savannah, your equatorial and your sub-equatorial regions, seasonal precipitation, um, temperatures between 24 and 29 degrees Celsius, but a little bit more variable than what we saw in the tropics. Grasses and forbs are going to make up the majority of your ground cover. Um, dominant plant species are fire adapted, um, can tolerate drought, especially over seasons. Um, 
common species that live there, insects, mammals, such as wild beasts, zebra, lions, and hyenas. Human fires actually do help maintain this biome, okay, because they help to kind of um, minimize that, um, the vertical layering that you would see. You're not going to have um, the light competition you would see in some of the others. So there's a Kenya savanna. Chaparral, mid-latitude, sorry, mid-latitude coastal regions on several continents, highly seasonal precipitation, rainy winters, dry summers, hot summers, fall, winter, spring are pretty cool. Um, 10 degrees Celsius, probably, I'm not doing the math right now off my head, 50 degrees, around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's dominated by shrubs, small trees, grasses, and herbs. Um, plants tend to be adapted to fire and drought. Um, amphibians, birds, reptiles, insects, mammals, browsing mammals. Um, humans have helped to reduce these areas, um, both through agriculture and urbanization. So there is an area of this in California. You can see in the U.S. we don't have a whole lot. It's that light brown area over there in the California part of the map. You can see some down in South America. You see some, again, at the top and the bottom of Africa. Looks like Portugal and Spain, some of those other southern, southern Europe countries. And we also see a little bit down there in the south and southwestern corner of Australia. Temperate grass, grassland, these are found on lots of continents, highly seasonal precipitation, cold winters, um, dry winters, hot, wet summers. Um, dominant plants, grasses, and forbs um, are able to um, deal with drought and fire well. They are adapted to it. Native mammals are your bison, wild horses, prairie dogs. Lots of grasslands have been converted to farmland. Um, so here is um, an example of one of these in Saskatchewan. So you can see um, the central part of the U.S. and some other areas in the western part. In South America, you can see it over on the southeastern side of the cont continent. And Africa, um, just that little small portion at the bottom south part of it. And then across the mid of, of Asia, uh, middle of Asia, you can see quite a lot of the grasslands. Northern coniferous forest or taiga. Um, these are found in northern North America and Eurasia. It's the largest terrestrial biome that we have on our planet. Its precipitation will vary. You can have droughts and you can have areas that gets lots of precipitation. They tend to be found near coast. Cold winters, hot summers. Siberia's temperatures there are pretty wild. Negative 50 degrees Celsius all the way up to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, conifers are going to dominate. Um, the conical shape of the conifers keeps the snow from building up so that their branches don't break. Um, you have migratory resident birds, large mammals, moose, brown bears, Siberian tigers, and these forests are being logged quite a lot. So you can see those both across North America and across um, Europe and Asia. So that's a Norway forest. Temperate broadleaf forest. This is found in the mid-latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere. Also have some in Chile, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Lots of precipitation during all seasons, either as rain or snow. Winters tend to be pretty cold, zero degrees Celsius. Summers are hot and humid, near 35 degrees Celsius. Vertical layers, you have your deciduous trees in the Northern Hemisphere, evergreen eucalyptus in Australia. Mammals, birds, and insects utilize all of those vertical layers. In the northern hemisphere, we have mammals that hibernate. Um, the forests have been heavily settled on in all continents, but there are some areas showing recovery. So there's Great Smoky Mount Mountains National Park in North Carolina. Tundra, expansive areas of the Arctic. Alpine tundra exists on high mountaintops at all latitudes. Low precipitation in the Arctic, higher in the Alpines. Cold winters, cool summers. Permafrost, um, we're seeing a lot of this disappear in, Af and, sorry, in Alaska. A permanently frozen layer of soil prevents water from being absorbed by that soil. Um, herbaceous vegetation, mosses, grasses, forbs, dwarf shrubs, trees, lichens. Um, these help to support birds, grazers, and their predators. Your mammals include your musk, oxen, oxen caribou, reindeer, bears, wolves, and foxes. Migratory bird species will nurse here nest here during the summer. Sparse settlement, um, but as you've seen in the news, um, tundra um, up in Alaska as one area I can think of offhand, focus of oil and mineral extraction. So there's Denali National Park. 
Aquatic biomes, these make up the largest part of our biosphere if we're looking at it in terms of area. They do not show as much variation, latitudinally speaking, as the terrestrial biomes. They have salt concentrations of about 3%. The largest um, marine biome is, your, is going to be made of oceans, 75% of your Earth's surface. Freshwater biomes will have salt concentrations much smaller, around, or sorry, less than 0.1%. These are linked to your soils and the biotic components that are needed of the surrounding terrestrial biomes. So zonation. Um, aquatic biomes tend to be stratified into zones or layers. They are defined by their ability to have light penetrate them, their temperature, and their depth. The upper photic zone has sufficient light for photosynthesis, while the lower aphotic zone um, does not get much light. Um, together, those make up the pelagic zone. Deep in the aphotic zone lies the abyssal zone, which has a depth of 2,000 to 6,000 meters. The benthic zone is the organic and inorganic sediment present at the bottom of all aquatic zones. The organisms and communities in that zone are known as the benthos. Detrius, dead organic matter, will fall from the productive surface water where you have that photic zone and provides a source of food for those organisms that are found in the lower aphotic zone and as well as the benthic zone. So there's your zonations in a lake. So you don't just have them in the ocean. And then you have the one on the right, which is a marine zonation. So you don't have as um, with the zonation in the lake, you'll notice you don't have the abyssal zone um, mark there. And you definitely don't have the, the, the drop that you see in, um, in meters, which you see in the ocean zonation. So in aquatic biomes, um, we have a temperature boundary that's called a thermocline that helps to separate the warm upper layer from the cold deeper layer. Um, lakes will mix their waters up, a semi-annual mixing. It's called turnover. And that helps to move the oxygenated water from the surface with the nutrient-rich water from the bottom so that they both get what they need. Um, aquatic biomes will vary with their depth, their light penetration, how far they are from shore, and where they are positioned in those zones that we talked about. Um, the organisms are, for the most part, going to live in that relatively shadow, shallow photic zone. Um, the aphotic zone is quite extensive, um, but does not contain much life. So there you can see your thermocline. Winter, spring, you see the movement. There you see the summer, and then you see the movement again of the water in the autumn. So there is a picture um, showing you of the different zones that are present aquatically wise. Um, they are characterized, by, I'm speaking, by their physical and chemical environments, geological features, the organisms, and heterotrophs. So lakes, you can have small ponds to large lakes. They tend to have more temperate lakes will have a seasonal thermocline. Tropical lowland lakes will have a year-round thermocline. Oligotropic lakes are nutrient poor and have lots of oxygen. Eutrophic lakes have lots of nutrients and typically are depleted of oxygen, especially if ice is covering them in the winter. So the eutrophic lakes have more surface area related, um, relative to their depth than the oligotrophic lakes. So rooted floating aquatic plants tend to live in the shallow and the well lighted because they've got to get that light to do photosynthesis uh, literal zone close to shore. Um, water is too deep in the limnetic zone to support rooted aquatic plants. Um, there are zooplankton that will graze on phytoplankton there. Um, zooplankton are heterotrophs. I'm not sure why I put that one on there twice. Sorry. Invertebrates will live in your benthic zone. Um, fishes live in any zone that has sufficient oxygen. Um, if humans provide additional sources of nutrients, that can lead to algae blooms, oxygen depletion, as well as fish kills. So there's an example of an oligotrophic lake and a eutrophic lake. Wetlands. Um, this is what we have at school. Um, habitat that is inundated by water at least some of the time and is able to support plants that are um, adapted to water saturated soil. Um, they have high organic production and decomposition, low dissolved oxygen. These can develop along shallow basins, flooded river banks, or the coast of large lakes and seas. They are some of the most productive biomes present on Earth. 
Um, plants found in them include lilies, cattails, sedges, tamarack, black spruce. They are home to diverse invertebrates and birds, otters, frogs, and alligators. Humans, unfortunately, have destroyed up to 90% of these. Uh, wetlands are used to help purify water and reduce flooding. So there's a basin wetland in the UK. Streams and rivers. Current is your most prominent physical characteristic. Headwaters tend to be cold, clear, turbulent, swift, and oxygen rich. They're often narrow and rocky. That's why you got to watch it when you're rafting. Downstream waters will form rivers and are generally a little warmer, a little more turbid, a little more oxygenated. Um, they can be wide, meandering, have silty bottoms, um, contain rooted aquatic plants, phytoplankton. Um, if you are, have an unpolluted river and stream, you can have quite a diversity of fishes and invertebrates. But if there is a fair amount of pollution that can degrade your water quality and kill these organisms, um, damming, flood control um, will impair the natural functioning of stream and river ecosystems. There's a headwater stream in the Great Smoky Mountains and the Loire River in France. Estuary, it's a transition between area between the river and the sea. Its salinity will vary with the rise and fall of your tides. They are nutrient rich, very productive, have lots, uh, a complex network of tidal channels, islands, natural levees, mud flats. Um, the major producers in these estuaries are your salt marsh grasses and algae. Um, abundant supply of food will attract your marine invertebrates, your fish, your waterfowl, and your marine mammals. Humans tend to consume oysters, crabs, and fish from these. And human interference upstream has disrupted estuaries across the world. So there's an estuary in the southeastern U.S. Intertidal zones. Um, these can be submerged periodically and then exposed by the tides. Um, organisms in these zones are challenged by temperature variations and salinity variations and just the physical mechanical force of wave movement. Um, oxygen nutrient levels tend to be high. Um, they can have rocky or sandy substrates. Um, sandy zones will um, support your seagrass and algae. Rocky zones will support marine algae that are attached. Um, if you're in a rocky zone, animals tend to have structural adaptations to attach to that substrate. If you're in a sandy zone, uh, organisms tend to bury themselves in it. Um, other animals that exist in these zones include sponges, sea anemones, echinoderms, and small fishes. Oil pollution has disrupted many of these. So there's a rocky intertidal zone out in Oregon. The oceanic pelagic zone is constantly mixed by wind-driven oceanic currents, high oxygen levels. Um, the turnover in the um, temperate oceans helps to renew nutrients in that photic zone. Um, the year-round stratification will lead to lower nutrient concentrations. Uh, it covers 70% of the Earth's surface, approximately speaking. Uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton are your dominant organisms. We also have some free-swimming animals. Um, examples of zooplankton, protist worms, copepods, krill, jellies, and vertebrate larvae. Um, animals that we also find in these zones, squids, fishes, sea turtles, marine mammals. Overfishing has reduced the um, population of fish present in the zone. And humans have generated a fair amount of pollution by dumping waste into this zone. So there's off of Hawaii. Coral reefs. These are formed from calcium carbonate skeletons of corals, nadarians. Um, shallow reef building corals will live in the photic zone, warm temperatures, clear water, deep sea corals will live much deeper, 200 to 1500 meters, so less light will be available. They require high oxygen concentrations and they need a solid substrate to be able to attach. Um, they can progress from a fringing reef to a barrier reef to a coral atoll. So there's a coral reef in your Red Sea. Marine benthic zone. It's an area on the seafloor below the surface waters of the coastal or neritic zone and the offshore pelagic zone. Organisms in this um, zone, the, uh, the deep benthic, abyssal zone, are um, adapted to very cold temperatures and extremely high water pressures. Your substrate tends to be soft sediments. There are some occasionally rocky areas. Seaweeds, filamentous algae are found here. Deep sea hydrothermal vents of volcanic origin um, tend to be surrounded by um, unique um, prokaryotes, uh, as well as echinoderms and arthropods. Um, neuritic benthic communities will include your invertebrates and some fishes. 
Um, as we saw previously, overfishing and pollution have depleted populations in this zone. So there's an example of a deep sea hydrothermal vent community. Interactions between organisms and environment will limit the species distribution. Um, so how species are distributed is yes, in part to evolution, but it also is impacted by ecological interactions um, that have taken place. Ecological is looking at minute by minute interactions between organisms and their environment, while evolution is looking not just at um, immediate, but over multiple generations and adaptations that have taken place as a result of natural selection. Um, ecological event things that e events that take place ecologically speaking can lead to evolutionary changes so the galapagos finches that had larger beaks not breaks sorry um, were more likely to survive droughts because they could eat the larger seeds um, so in the next generation uh, beak size tended to be larger um, and over time this led to an evolutionary change so factors that can influence your species distribution, biotic and abiotic can play a role. Um, so the climate, the interspecific um, interactions and other factors um, impact on kangaroos. So what do ecologists do? Um, they look at where species are and what would allow species to be able to exist where they are. Dispersal. When individuals move away from areas of high population density or where they were originally, um, their speciation event took place, um, this is what allows to global distribution of organisms. Um, natural range expansions, adaptive radiation, talked about adaptive radiation back with evolution. Natural range expansions show kind of how dispersion can play a role on the distribution of a species. Um, the cattle egrets arrived in the Americas in the late 1800s, and they have expanded their distribution since. And sometimes we will see that when you start to have um, greater distances of dispersal, dispersion, you can have adaptive radiation occur. So the Hawaiian silver swords descended from an ancestral North American tarweed. Species transplants. Um, this is how invasive species can get involved. Um, organisms that are intentionally or accidentally relocated from their original distribution. Sometimes it's successful, um, and that might indicate that the range is a little bit more, um, larger than what it was actually intended to be or actually existed at that time. Um, but sometimes it can cause some significant issues. It can disrupt your communities or ecosystems and cause more long-range um, detriments or long-range disadvantages to those communities or ecosystems. Um, organisms don't necessarily occupy all of their potential range. Um, habitats may play a role as to where they end up being. Um, biotic factors that could affect are your um, predation, um, herbivory, and competition. So abiotic factors that can influence um, temperature, water, sunlight, wind, rocks, and soil. And those will vary depending on location and time, what the environment's like. Temperature. Environmental temperature will play a role because we've seen how temperature can impact on biological processes. Um, cells, um, because they have lots of water in them, will freeze and rupture below zero degrees Celsius. And we know from when we studied macromolecules, proteins, um, can become denatured um, above certain temperatures, 45 degrees Celsius, and then they would no longer be working properly. And since those are your enzymes, that can cause all sorts of issues. And also mammals and birds have to expend energy too because um, they, um, remember, they are, they are regulators as opposed to controllers. Sorry, I had to get the right word. Um, so to maintain their internal temperature, they have to maintain that homeostasis to be able to survive. So water and oxygen, water is going to play a key role because we need water to survive. Desert organisms have adaptations to be able to conserve water. Um, oxygen um, will be impacted by water because it diffuses slowly in it. Um, so oxygen concentrations can be quite low in your deeper oceans and lakes. Salinity. 
um, salt concentration, um, as we talked about with the excretory system, that can affect your water balance or osmosis. Aquatic organisms either typically are going to be found in freshwater or saltwater environments. And there are very few terrestrial organisms that are going to be adapted to high salinity habitats. Sunlight. Um, the light intensity and its quality can impact on photosynthesis. So because water is able to absorb light um, in aquatic environments, you're going to see more photosynthesis take place closer to the surface. In desert, there's plenty of light available, which will get provide energy, and that can cause stresses on both plants and animals. Soil um, characteristics will just um, limit where we find plants. Um, and then because that's what animals will feed on, that will limit them as well. Their physical structure, the pH, and the composition, minerally speaking. 